most of you will know this talk will be about globalization. And to start with, I want to encourage you to use a bit of imagination, right? And so imagine what the world would look like if each country kept to themselves. Imagine how life could have been if each country was like an independent bubble made up of the very same people, yet so different from their counterparts in other bubbles. And at least for me, this is unimaginable. Um, you can consider me to be a product of globalization. I was born in 2004 in Italy. Well, I suppose it was, two, it was 2004 everywhere, um, but <laughs> that's not the point. Um, I was born in Italy uh, to Chinese parents, and here I am studying in an English school. You know, the power of globalization is really, really immense. Uh, for example, the World Bank has found that over the past 40 years, China has managed to pull 800 million people out of poverty. That is roughly equal to 12 UKs in terms of population size. And I also feel like it's a very incredible figure. And so maybe we all owe the life we are currently living to globalization, right? And my interpretation of globalization is one that it's like Noah's Ark. It brings us all to salvation from poverty. And since it plays such a crucial role in affecting our, in affecting our lives, the focus of, of today's talk, therefore, will not be on the obvious reasons of why you should join Noah and his happy adventures for survival, but on how to improve the design of this immensely powerful economic structure to adapt it for the 21st century and hopefully beyond. And I'm very excited to tell you just about this. But obviously, we need to start with the basics, right? Globalization at its core is the process in which goods and services are traded between different countries, each of them producing and selling what they're best in. And this seems to be uh, very intuitive, right? Net exporters, such as China, benefit because they get more customers. And net importers, such as the UK, also benefit because, well, they get things for cheaper. And with everything produced, uh, at, more, at a more efficient rate. In theory, therefore, it's a win-win. Everyone gets more stuff out of the same amount of resources. And you know, over the past couple of decades, the eagerness of countries around the world to adopt this doctrine and to push for a lowering of uh, barriers to international trade has led to the formation of a very, very distinct form of organization multinational corporations, or MNCs for short. You know, these big firms stand at the forefront of technological research, spending hundreds of billions in R&D, as well as employing huge numbers of workers around the world. And, uh, you know, th th they're, they're so big that it's hard to conceive uh, how really important this is uh, for us. Over the past few years, they have been an integral part in our lives, raising our living standards, as well as broadening their reach and influence. And shockingly, more Americans didn't tell you about Amazon or Google, or even Apple, than to point to Ukraine on a map. That is just incredible. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, it is very easy to find case studies of countries around the world uh, who abuse their power. Right? For as beneficial as these companies can be, there are many downsides which may come when some of them get too big. For starters, a report by the OECD found that with the 100th biggest MNCs around the world generated a revenue of 10 trillion US dollars in 2016. That is roughly equal to a seventh of the global ec uh, economy. And to think that when the market capitalization of some MNCs dwarf the GDP of certain countries, who do you think is the one in power? The legislator or the CEO, right? And so in this constant power struggle, legislators often find themselves being forced to abide by the rules set by these MNCs in order to attract them and create jobs in the local economy, often by introducing lucrative tax breaks as well as lowering the regulatory standards. 
And obviously, when we have enough countries doing the same, uh, race to the bottom of regulatory requirements is being formed because each country will be competing against each other in order to attract the best MNCs. You know, for example, Bangladesh has tried to do just this, and it led to the construction of many structurally unstable buildings because it introduced lax building regulations to make it easier for countries, companies to set up their activities there. And an example of this is the Rana Plaza building, which killed 1,100 people upon its collapse. There are many more buildings, such as this one, with still thousands and thousands of workers, most of them underpaid, who are still working in them. You may argue that uh, this is still, still better than having no work at all, but I'd say we can do better and we should do better. Um, think about it, right? If you, are, you dislike what your government is doing, you just go on a protest or vote them out of power when the next uh, vote, voting comes, from, comes in. But obviously that's harder to do when we're talking about a firm, right? The CEO can't really be replaced in the same way that legislators can be. And so ultimately, local citizens are the ones losing out since they have no job security guarantee when their employer wields such great amounts of power. And so perhaps unsurprisingly, this competitive advantage has led to many firms possessing the power of abusing it and to bully other smaller firms and to exterminate their competition. In fact, data from Refinitiv has found that big tech companies have spent at least 264 billion US dollars buying up potential rivals uh, worth less than one billion each since the start of 2021. These are all difficult problems that we need to deal with. And reluctance from past governments to do so has led to sufferings which could have been avoided should a more proactive approach been adopted. You know, before Galileo caught a mild case of death, his, um, his obsessions about celestial objects uh, laid the foundations for the human moon landings um, 400 years later. So today, I would like to become Galileo and take you through a journey through my version of globalization and maybe uh, for a structure which goes beyond the, this purpose. And so my version of globalization is one where instead of a couple dominant firms in their respective industry, right, uh, there are many thousands and thousands of smaller businesses each competing against each other struggling for survival, and yet providing the greatest good for society. And in this version of globalization, there's no national champion who, which abuses its power uh, for endless exploitation. Only small businesses, each competing against each other, uh, bidding for the rights to operations sold by a global organization who is motivated by broad societal welfare. In this version, Competition is maximized, and so profits are more likely to be reinvested, and the world will probably become a better place. If it sounds confusing, that's probably because it is. But let me uh, go, go through this further. You know, I myself position myself, I myself think that uh, a free market is good, but government intervention is also needed. And so I'm an ad advocate for a free market approach with moderate government intervention to smoothen out uh, any economic transactions as well as regulate it without causing too many unintended consequences due to information failures. I also believe that this is the best way to do it. If you agree, very well done. Um, but if you don't, I guess you just need to stick with it. Um, um, uh, yeah, um, so... <laughs> And so just think about it. We need to use this philosophy to try to uh, preserve the good that MNCs bring in, as well as making sure that the downsides they have are addressed correctly. To do this, we need to change the structure and how things work. And so, in other words, we need to make sure that whoever does the job get best gets the job, as well as making sure that uh, the interest of everyone, not only that of shareholders, is protected. And what I am thinking of is a global structure 
made up of individual divisions, each coordinating the operations for a certain product type. Um, and so, for instance, this would really make more sense if I use an example. And so let's take the mobile phones division and call it, I don't know, Mobile Corp. Um, don't judge the name, please. Mobile Corp will be responsible for the manufacturing and selling of, a, of mobile phones to customers, but it determines who should do this. Well, how, how do you do this, you may ask? Well, through auctions. You know, the idea is for Mobile Corp to sell off the rights to operations for certain projects, such as the research for its chips or the manufacturing of its components to bidders, each of them providing a solution for a certain sum of money. Through the use of auction theory and the work of the two Nobel laureates, Milgram and Wilson, the two chaps here, um, we can make sure that many interrelated tasks are being sold simultaneously uh, by a single organization who is motivated, again, by maximizing societal welfare. But for this to work, really, another thing must be done, and this is highly controversial. Intellectual property rights must be removed. And at its place, we need to construct a library, open access library, where all forms of technologies are readily available for anyone, anywhere, and at any time. You know, this will exterminate all forms of legal barriers to entry for firms because firms previously could not use certain types of technology, well, because of patents. And so, Instead, anyone can come in, learn, and join the market by providing a bid for a certain project. And by definition, only the best ones and the most suitable proposals will be chosen. So the, so the idea is to shift the incentive for R&D from the one of, of the purpose of patenting and, and gaining a competitive advantage by preventing the competition to, uh, to use the better technology to the one of being commissioned to do so for a certain sum of money. So the work of Mobile Corp really here is uh, being a customer facing platform, uh, determining what should be done, how it should be done, and essentially who should do it. You know, in a future made up of Mobile Corp, I don't know, just making the, the names, uh, Jacket Corp, uh, Desk Corp, Fruit Corp, or heck, even Marijuana Corp, we really do have something to look forward to uh, other than weird and honestly horrible names. And, you know, obviously this idea is still premature and there are many more issues that we need to deal with uh, when it comes to setting up the platform, such as corruption or uh, lack of customer choice. But I do think that this is the first step towards the right direction. And for as far-fetched, um, controversial, and politically impossible as this idea may seem to you and will probably remain, I do think that this should be devoted more attention to. And so, a customer-facing organization, an open access library for technology, and thousands of bidder firms. That is my vision for the future. And you know what? To make this a reality, the formula to do this is really quite simple. Um, it's you plus me to spread the message. It's a bit of an imag imagination when it comes to the formulation of policies to tackle any potential difficulties that might lie ahead. And the most important one, balls of steel. Thank you very much.